When it was all over in 1933, Prohibition had produced few heroes. It created an abundance of notorious villains, mobsters and gunmen whose names regularly appeared in the papers and newsreels and are still familiar. Bugs Moran, Dutch Schultz, and Al Capone. Meanwhile, on the side of the law were Elliot Ness and J. Edgar Hoover. But there's a third name worth remembering, probably the most effective agent of law enforcement in the Roaring Twenties, Mabel Walker Willebrandt. For several years in the early 20s, she earned a national reputation for her integrity, effectiveness, and brains. While still in her 30s, the New York Times was calling her one of the keenest legal minds in the United States. She was widely regarded as the most powerful woman in America, and the most famous woman who wasn't a movie actress. Just 10 years before all this fame, she was teaching school by day and attending law school at night. As soon as she could, she began taking on pro bono cases. She soon became the first female public defender in Los Angeles, arguing over 2,000 cases and only accepting cases from women. In 1921, she was recommended for the post of Assistant Attorney General in President Harding's administration. She moved to Washington and was given responsibility for prosecuting prohibition violations and tax fraud, as well as managing and reforming federal prisons. By then, prohibition had been in effect for over a year. It was enforced by a limited number of federal agents who had to rely on support from state and local law officials. Most of the arrests had been made at the tail end of the bootlegging chain, locking up speakeasy operators, small distillers, and delivery boys. Willebrandt saw this and said, give me the authority and let me have my pick of 300 men and I'll make this country as dry as it is humanly possible to get it. There's one way it can be done, get at the source of supply. I have no patience with this policy of going after the hip pocket and speakeasy cases. That's like trying to dry up the Atlantic Ocean with a blotter. It was a tough job, made even tougher by the lack of cooperation from her Justice and Treasury Department colleagues. Many of President Harding's advisors were his old drinking buddies, who either disapproved of or disregarded prohibition law. Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon despised prohibition. He had invested heavily in distilleries. Meanwhile, Attorney General Harry Doherty was getting rich, selling pardons, paroles, and protection to bootleggers. Willebrandt began giving prohibition real enforcement, replacing corrupt agents with honest ones. She said, I refuse to believe that out of our 120 million population, it's impossible to find 4,000 men who can't be bought. She reviewed the work of U.S. attorneys who were failing to enforce the Volstead Act and compiled a list rating each from inefficient to obstructionist. When she fired ineffective prosecutors, she was criticized by her colleagues. She brought down the largest bootlegging ring in the U.S., located in Savannah, Georgia, and she put away George Remus, a multimillionaire who was considered the king of the bootleggers. During her time in the Justice Department, she handled over 160,000 prohibition cases, and she presented 278 cases before the Supreme Court. It was Willebrandt, not Elliot Ness, who came up with the idea of prosecuting major bootleggers for income tax evasion, which was how Al Capone was ultimately defeated. Between prosecutions, she worked to improve federal penitentiary facilities for women, promote better training of law enforcement personnel, and raise the efficiency of the federal court system. In 1928, she campaigned heavily for Herbert Hoover. The newspaper said no other woman had ever had such an impact on a presidential election. Willebrand hoped that Hoover would name her attorney general. But after he was elected, he called her one day and said the job would go to William D. Mitchell, a man who'd be more neutral about prohibition. She resigned and moved back to California, where she represented clients in the aviation and film industry. Willebrandt strongly disapproved of appointing women to public office just because they were women. But, she said, 
I am enough of a feminist to hold the opinion that there is no professional or public duty which a woman is not capable of performing. This video is brought to you by the Saturday Evening Post Digital Archives. Saturday Evening Post members can explore our 200-year-old archive for only $15 a year. Subscribe today.